I turn now to rights and public discourse. Rights can also achieve more ethereal, though no less dramatic, effects. They can change the spirit of the times. Wielding them can radically alter the terms and indeed the outcome of national debate on fiercely contested social policy. Differently put, rights talk and rights assertion can alter social discourse in significant ways. In 1998, President Thabo Mbeki plunged my country into a ghastly nightmare. The reason was his support for AIDS denialism. When he assumed the presidency in May 1999, the AIDS epidemic was cruelly corroding my country's life and health. In less than 10 years, the prevalence amongst women attending antenatal clinics had soared from 0.7% in 1990 to over 20% in 1999. The death toll was frightening. In 1998, it is estimated that one quarter of a million people died in South Africa of AIDS-related causes. I had close personal knowledge of death from AIDS since I had escaped it myself. In 1997, 12 years after being infected with HIV, I fell very severely ill with AIDS. But my judge's salary meant that I could take antiretroviral treatment. The result for me was momentous. From facing certain death within a median period of 30 months, my health and energy and vigor were restored to me. Little less than a year later, in 1999, I was so well that I could start campaigning publicly for the drugs that saved my life at very high cost to be made available to all on my continent. President Mbeki did not agree. From October 1999, he lent endorsement to a group of discredited dissidents who cast doubt on the medical science of AIDS. He repeatedly questioned the viral etiology of AIDS, the efficacy and safety of drug treatments for it, and the reliability and meaning of AIDS statistics. Worse, he refused to allow his government to distribute antiretroviral treatments, the only known response, effective response to AIDS. The effects were horrific. As hundreds of thousands fell ill and died, decisive government action was delayed for years in the midst of an absurd, obfuscatory debate. Conservative calculations shown and published in the Harvard Medical Journal show that more than 330,000 lives, what epidemiologists call 2.2 million person years, were lost because President Mbeki thwarted a feasible and timely ARV treatment program. This horror did not go unchallenged. The treatment action campaign, founded to tackle the iniquities of drug pricing, was forced to turn its attention to presidential denialism instead. It did so unflinchingly. The Congress of South African Trade Unions joined it in challenging the president and in campaigning for rational policies and treatment. But their courage was isolated. Large sections of society were cowed into silence. President Mbeki was a forbidding man who headed the governing party with an illustrious history and a massive electoral majority. Many were fearful of crossing him. The issue, a mass epidemic of sexually transmitted disease on a country, on a, in a country and a continent oppressed by centuries of racism, was explosive. As a result, most members of South Africa's political elite stayed mute. Business leaders were silent. Some intellectuals actively kowtowed to the president. Members of his party and cabinet, even those regarded as independent, refused to say openly that AIDS was caused by HIV. Even international diplomats were cowed. Out of fear, conformity, deference or sycophancy, the establishment maintained an appalled silence while activists and their allies struggled to persuade the president that his stance was ruinous. Their struggle was in vain. President Mbeki would not budge. In the gloomiest hour, the activists turned to the courts. They sought an order requiring President Mbeki's government to make available a cheap drug 
nevirapine that enabled pregnant mothers to halve the risk of transmitting HIV to their babies. Government vehemently opposed, but in December 2001, the High Court granted the order sought. Government appealed to the Constitutional Court. In an historic judgment, the Court ordered government to make available nevirapine or a suitable substitute available at public clinics to pregnant mothers who sought it. The judgment was a ringing victory for treatment access as well as for rational public discourse. As a simple matter of history, it was the pivot that eventually forced government to take decisive action in the epidemic. Albeit grudgingly at first, government eventually gave effect to it. Large-scale provision of antiretrovirals began in 2004, 30 months after the judgment. And today, nearly 1.5 million South Africans are living because of antiretroviral treatment, like I am, except that most of them are receiving it free from public clinics. This is the largest publicly provided AIDS treatment program anywhere in the world. Undoubtedly, it is the most significant material consequence of the decision in the TAC case. More even than Khrutboom, that case materially changed the conditions of life for hundreds of thousands of people. It enabled them not to die. That, of course, is an important point, a bricks and mortar point, but it is not the point I want to highlight here. My point is that the assertion of legal rights and their vindication by the courts can fundamentally alter the framework, the terms, and the weight of public discourse. That, in turn, of course, enables changes in material conditions of life. The decision in TAC, of course, had a dramatic institutional and operational effect, but it also had a discursive and ideological effect. 21 months before the TAC decision, the court had outlawed irrational job discrimination against those living with HIV. Its decision then, in the Hoffman case, had pointedly set out the medical facts of AIDS, even though the science was not in dispute. Despite these passages in the judgment, the decision was noted mainly for its effect in containing discrimination. Though delivered 11 months after President Mbeki's public flirtation with denialism began, the decision was not seen as rebuking it. There could be no similar ambiguity about the treatment action campaign judgment. It was a rebuke not only for government inaction on AIDS, but for the absurd obfuscation that underlay it. That poor women had a legal right to use antiretroviral drugs to protect their babies from HIV transmission, and that government was constitutionally obliged to offer them the choice to take it, dealt a blow that would eventually prove fatal to the ludicrous discourse of AIDS denialism. President Mbeki had made his stand on AIDS an article of faith of his administration. He had proved impervious to anguished activist pressure, to international scientific entreaty, and to impassioned condemnation by commentators. But large sectors of the establishment elite, including members of his own party and of government, had maintained a coward silence. By contrast, the Constitutional Court unerringly committed its moral capital to this issue. Its stand affirming medical science proved pivotal. Presidentially licensed denialism continued to dog the Mbeki government's response to the epidemic, but the court's authoritative assertion of reason provide, pr proved a vital intervention that shifted public and governmental discourse in ways that eventually triggered effective action. The judgment constituted an authoritative, morally cogent and politically irrefutable assertion of the science of AIDS and the necessity for public action in accordance with it. It showed the court as a source not merely of institutional decision-making power, but of unparalleled moral and intellectual authority. My retired colleague, Justice Cato Regan, has recently emphasized the importance of the court as a forum for reasoned debate on contested matters of public policy. The TAC decision shows the immense public power of that reason when rightfully employed.